I want to welcome you all to the OCT Prioritization Post-COVID webinar. This is part of the Zeiss Ophthalmic Virtual Experience. We're going to speak about glaucoma during COVID and what we think about what's going to happen after COVID as well. And we're going to hopefully give you some pearls in terms of diagnostics that can be particularly useful during these times. I'm very grateful to have my colleague and friend, Matt Schlenker from University of Toronto. I brought Matt along here because he's a smart guy uh, and I'm just here to, for the show. So thank you all for being here. Uh, we're going to start off uh, just talking a little bit about what we're doing during COVID. So of course, we have a lot of discussion about which patients do we see during COVID and perhaps more importantly, who are we going to see during the more normalization period after the lockdowns are eased? We can think of patients in terms of how urgent it is to see the patient. Factors may include what the status of the other eye is, the severity of the glaucoma, how high the pressure has been, and what the next step will be in terms of the risk. We need to kind of balance this out in terms of, of course, the risk and in terms of what the access will be. It'll depend, I guess, of course, what the protocols are and the community standards are based on government. It'll be based on the patient, of course, and their ability to come in, the compliance with the treatment, of course, and how much we all are going to be willing to take the risks that are involved, of course, bringing patients in, especially some of the older patients that we have that are typical of our glaucoma population. Now, the role of teleophthalmology, of course, is evolving, and certainly there's been a lot of discussion on this. There are certain things that we, we know we can't do. For example, it's hard to obviously measure IOP without a patient coming in. Obviously, surgery patients need to come in, laser therapy patients need to come in, and follow-up for some of these procedures are important to be seen in person. So there are other things, of course, that we can do, and I've realized uh, over the course of the last two months the benefit of having that discussion with a patient over the phone or, or even through video conferencing, confirming medications, checking on their compliance, reassuring the patient has been something that has really been valuable as well. And then just speaking to the patient and maybe triaging them, although glaucoma is primarily asymptomatic, there are certain things that we can perhaps, you know, clue on that may make us concerned. And then there are other issues, particularly on the diagnostic side, which I think are still debatable. And one thing that we've been looking at and using has been the eye care. Uh, eye care rebontonometry has reasonable correlation with gold bentonometry. And the ability to now take this home and measure is something we've been doing for many years. This can be sent to patients' homes to be measured and sent back to us to be able to assess. And this may be a way we can actually measure patients' IOP without them coming in. Or if they do come in, rebound tonometry may be an alternative to global tonometry. So something perhaps we can look at. Of course, we have to think about as well all the diagnostics we use in glaucoma, particularly when it comes to imaging, structural changes, as well as functional visual field testing. And this is where we need to think about how do we reduce the risk, reduce the harm to both the patient as well as our staff and ourselves by proper hygiene and proper distance as well. In terms of disinfectants, of course, this has been all over the news. Fortunately, the COVID coronavirus, COVID-19, is very susceptible to a variety of different disinfectants. Most commonly used, for example, is 70% alcohol as well. And, and these agents seem to be pretty effective. So we know we have a lot of agents that we can use that are reasonably effective as well. There are a variety of different things that companies like Zeiss have come out with in terms of repairing, for example, in this case, uh, the chin rest, put uh, the forehead, as well as the uh, grips that the patient may be holding, either for visual field or for imaging as well, which may be an alternative to wiping down surfaces as well. The ability, of course, for these devices like the Cirrus to have an onboard PC is an advantage during these times to remote desktop in, to be able to uh, extend the distance between the workstation and the control and the patient perhaps in another room even. These are all alternatives that we can perhaps consider as we think about safe distancing and proper hygiene and management as well. There, are, of course, have been a lot of debate in the glaucoma literature as well as in the community. How do we clean the bowl? And this is an area, a little bit of uncertainty. We know, of course, that the specialized surface on this bowl is, is a very important part in determining retinal sensitivity. The intention was not to have it regularly cleaned and frequent contact uh, and rubbing and irritation may cause perhaps a degradation of the performance. The recommendations are that 70% uh, isopropyl alcohol can be used, and this can be used to spray into the bowl uh, with a light mist and just to dab away any droplets that may form. Uh, we're still evolving in this area here, of course. There's a lot of debates, but I think one thing I think is certain, having a patient wearing a mask, I think, is really important. Uh, whether they're coming into the office or getting any testing done, a mask protects others. It protects equipment from potentially getting exposure to a patient who may be sick. I think that's the one thing that's, that's for certain as well. If we are going to do a test, though, it does raise the question. We have, of course, a lot of different options when we consider this between OCT and visual field. So, Matt, I want to bring you in this conversation here. We use these devices a lot. I mean, every patient that comes in, we see them, and we do these devices regularly. There are some differences, of course, in these devices. What are your thoughts in terms of if you're going to only do one test during this era, particularly if there's a surge or, or a major pandemic issue in your community, what are your thoughts about what to use and how to use them? 
Yeah, th thank you, Ike. This is something that I think myself and, and many of us, as well as our office staff, have been thinking about our patients too. You know, we do have many patients who are concerned. I think when the uh, pandemic first started and in a complete lockdown setting, the answer was pretty much doing no diagnostic testing unless it was really going to change management at that point. So for instance, if a, if a new patient comes in with a pressure of 30 on no medications, it's not clear that it's going to change your management necessarily to do your tests right away. Uh, you may just start them on uh, treatment. With that said, if you have a patient with a pressure of 30 on maximum tolerated medications, uh, you may want to get a better sense of the stage of their glaucoma, both from a structural and a functional standpoint, before you decide on the urgency and then which surgery you're going to perform. In terms of going forward, as now we're thinking about lightening up, I think it's going to depend. I think for patients who are in the earlier stage of the disease, I think we're going to still spend a little more time focusing on the structure versus patients who are established glaucoma patients with established uh, functional knowledge, so we know that what their fields look like, or they may be getting some of the floor effects that we see with our conventional OCT structural testing. I think the visual field is going to be more important. And just to illustrate here with a couple cases, this is a patient, uh, when we look at their RNFL, here on the left, and then we look at their ganglion cell. We're gonna get a little bit more into the specifics of analyzing later, but these are quite reassuring tests from my perspective. They fit well within the realm of a, a typical patient in the normative database. Not really a lot of signs of focal damage here. But of course, sometimes when we do the visual field for the first time, and this was this patient's first time, you can see it raises all sorts of questions and complexities. And I think in a COVID setting, this may, I said, raise more questions than it does answers. You may look at that uh, right visual field and see a hemianopic area there. The left, there's all kinds of scattered changes, potentially some focal defects, and you'd at least want to be repeating this test, if not sending the, the patient for further evaluation. So I, I do think we have to make sure that we're comfortable with our testing, knowing that we're doing it for a particular purpose, and that it's going to give us an outcome where there's acceptable next steps. The other extreme is someone who has very advanced glaucoma, and this is maybe almost too extreme, where we really don't have much left on the OCT for sure, if not the visual field. This patient, you may make the argument that really you're gonna stop doing the diagnostic testing and really just focus on the eye pressure, but if someone does have some visual field left, I think that would be the most important for this patient, and given their difficulties and the floor effects seen on the OCT, you may defer the OCT at this time. Well, what does the future hold? I do think this is gonna cause a full reevaluation of how we approach patient care, especially things that involve close contact. And you do wonder if some of the new technologies in the OCTA space may be helpful to make it so that we don't have to do two tests, but that we can go back, go to one test. So just to illustrate here, there's been a lot of promise, not as much on the flow side of the OCT, but on the uh, density side, looking for capillary dropout, identifying that in a reproducible fashion that may be more sensitive than our conventional RNFL and ganglion cell structural analysis. It may have less of a floor effect or at least a, a floor effect that happens later in the disease. And if we can correlate with the visual field so that we can predict the visual field with reasonable certainty, this may be become more important in our arsenal for diagnosis, for management, and again, maybe eliminating some of our need for uh, visual field testing. Time will tell. Something else that I've been using in my own practice and haven't really delineated its exact role is the concept of using the new algorithm called CETA Faster instead of the either CETA Fast or CETA Standard, which has been my uh, standard practice since I started my practice. The first question is, is the CETA faster algorithm faster than CETA standard and CETA fast? And the answer is a resounding yes. I think this is borne out in the literature and my own clinical experience, where my patients, I still have the false negative function on there, which is probably adding a little bit of time, but my patients rarely take more than three minutes to do this test. And I've gotten a lot of good feedback from the patients. And I think time is of the essence uh, during COVID. So it's something to think about. I would say particularly for people who are doing CETA fast, where that's their standard of care, maybe from a screening standpoint. On the precision side, I have been reasonably impressed with what I've seen in the literature. I said, I think compared to CETA FAST, I don't think we're losing uh, very much. The algorithm is not necessarily losing precision in terms of 
how much testing is being done. In fact, you're going to see if we combine with the combined that we're getting more points. For instance, some of the strategies that are better in this regard are using age match controls to start off the threshold and no longer using the full threshold database, but instead using a CETA database to uh, predict where to do the next threshold. On that note, the combined analysis I think is helpful because we're basically getting some of the points that we get in the 10-2, those points that are particularly uh, relevant or physiological susceptible uh, to developing glaucoma that have been built into this. Time will tell whether this will completely negate the need for a 10-2. I'm not sure that it will for some of our patients. From a screening perspective, in the context of COVID, I think this is quite useful. And I'll just show you a case here to illustrate. Uh, this is the RNFL and ganglion cell analysis for a patient. And I'm just going to focus here on the left eye, where we have quite a clear area on our thickness map and also on our uh, deviation map that is suggestive of focal loss consistent with glaucoma. And this is right in, in what Donald Hood has coined the macular vulnerability zone. Uh, and we can see that as well here, this loss on the T-SNP plot we're gonna talk about a little later, which is really the most important plot that I often look at in my glaucoma. And this is corroborated on the ganglion cell analysis, both on the thickness map and then also on the deviation map. So especially in the left eye, the right eye is a little more nuanced, but the left eye, I think we're fairly convinced that there's some glaucoma damage here. And now we wanna look from a functional perspective where, whether the patient's been affected. What you can see here, if we pay attention to the left eye, we don't see much on our gray plot here. On the total deviation plot, what we're seeing, which also translates to the pattern deviation plot, is three spots that show up at the 0.5% range that are not our regular 24-2 spots. So that means if I had not done the 24-2C, I would have not known that this patient had some loss in a paracentral manner. And Donald Hood has really illustrated this well, that uh, we basically don't have a lot of spots or points evaluated in a 24-2, and we can have paracentral defects or really any early defects in glaucoma that will miss those spots. And that's where the 24-2C has been quite helpful. Thank you, Matt. I want to continue along here, and let's talk a little bit more about talking about the analysis of these images, because of course, no matter what, during before or after COVID, the ability to properly analyze an image and a printout is critical, of course, for proper management. The single printout, of course, is very helpful in looking at the entire optic nerve head and RNFL platform to ensure that we evaluate for any elements of disease, but also important to look for artifact as well, which we'll be talking about. One of the things I think that's really important to help understand is how is the optic nerve head calculated? And understanding the way the machine uses this, which is essentially the termination of Brux membrane, the anterior cord capillaris, is a very useful ability to ensure that we delineate the edge of the nerve head. This is critical, of course, to determine the nerve size, as well as the relative position of the RNFL circle. This is also helpful in patients who've had PPA or peripheral atrophy, where it's difficult to actually see the disc margin and the rim margin. It's helpful to identify this by OCT. It would be impossible to do it without OCT as well. And so these are important things to understand as well. And as we put this together, it is helpful to understand the difference between small, average, and large nerves. And we know that small and large nerves potentially can cause artifact and diagnosis, can cause artifact in how we look at OCTs as well. So it's helpful to divide up these nerve heads in terms of small, medium, or large, or average. And this can help us again as we evaluate patients' nerves clinically, as well as looking at the OCT as well. There's, of course, a lot of discussion in terms of where do we look for glaucoma and where do you look for progression? And the ability to entirely map the posterior pole, looking at the optic nerve head, looking at the RNFL, and of course, looking now at the macular area, specifically ganglion cell analysis, gives us a really complete picture. And there are a lot of questions that persist, of course. Where's the best place to look for glaucoma? How do we put it together? And those are some of the things we hope to be able to share with you today as well. We want to share some, some thoughts on red that we see on OCT. And this is particularly relevant in COVID because we know that some of the red that we see on OCT is either artifact, that it's normal anatomy that's outside the normative database, or that it's non-glaucomatous. And we, we want to make sure that we minimize the number of referrals and repeated visits in this context. So all the more reason to be particularly cognizant of some of this uh, red disease, as we call it. And I really want to give credit to Dr. Donald Hood for asking us or imploring us clinicians to be more like radiologists. And I would just add to that that not only do we want to be more like radiologists, but we don't want to be stockbrokers. 
uh, looking at our printouts. By that I mean just not focusing on the red and green, but instead really diving deep into the anatomy of these scans. So I'm just going to start off here uh, with an example. This is a patient referred to me with uh, apparent glaucoma, a 27-year-old male. He did have a family history. He had no known history of an elevated uh, eye pressure. I'm just going to walk through a little bit the way that I look at these uh, single printouts. One thing that is important to make sure you have the right patient and to make sure that you have the patient's age because our deviation map is very much a function of the age. I do look at the signal strength, though I do not take that, again, I'm not being a stockbroker here. I'm going to still be a radiologist and I'm going to look at my anatomy. So I do want to see six out of 10 or better, but that is not going to preclude me from going to the next step, which is to look at the anatomy where I'm going to look at my thickness map on each side. Here on this, I'm looking for relative symmetry between the two eyes. I'm looking for any focal uh, loss, and I'm looking for any signs here that this patient may not fall within our normative database. I then go to my deviation map, keeping in mind that this deviation map is a function of less or fewer than 300 patients. So the patient may or may not fit in to this normative category. And then I go down to my circular tomogram. And for my circular tomogram, I'm making sure that the segmentation that's been done of the RNFL actually makes sense, that there's no areas of dropout. And I'm going to show some good examples of that a little bit later. Once I'm reasonably comfortable with this, I will look at some of the stockbroker type statistics here. I think Ike made a very important point about looking at the uh, disc area. When you have a large disc area, you are going to pretty much by definition also have a large cup to disc ratio. And if you have a small disc area you and you have a large cup to disc ratio, I think you should be concerned right away. Once I've taken a look at those, I really spend a lot of time on my T-SNET plot. And the T-SNET plot is really taking this circle, circle scan, which is in purple, and it's actually just taking, breaking it up and putting it as a linear line. And in this case, we go from temporal to temporal. So the break you know, is out here in the temporal region, which I think is a little bit unfortunate that we've done it this way, just because the macula is actually most important. I would have preferred to be in the center. And the most recent versions of Forum actually do allow you to modulate that. So let's reflect a little bit on this patient. I think the glaringly obvious potential issue here is this area of red that is very symmetric on both sides. At first glance, this may look like a glaucomatous defect. It is superior. It could be interpreted as in the superior pole. The symmetry, of course, is a little bit reassuring. And it's a little weird that the defect, while it is emanating from the disc and continuous, it's a little bit nasal compared to normal. And that's where we can see actually in the normative database, this is a well-documented phenomenon where sometimes the RNFL bundles may not converge completely before they come in to the nerve or particularly in the 3.46 millimeter diameter of the circle scan. And what we have here is a dropout or a split in the RNFL bundle. There's really two nice healthy bundles there, but in the middle there, we can see that there's a little bit of, I wouldn't call it an area of loss necessarily, but just a low area in between these two bundles. And we do have the ganglion cell analysis, which can reassure us here that we're not seeing uh, a lot of issues either on the thickness map or the deviation map, and we see a very nice segmentation on our horizontal B scans. So depending on your learning style, you can look at the left side or the right side of this screen. The left side actually documents the anatomy where we know that these RNFL bundles do not necessarily come together before they come into the nerve. And you can have this phenomenon called a split RNFL bundle. And we just have a lot of different styles, not unlike the different ha hairstyles that we see in our very own uh, Ike Ahmed. So I just want you to remember anytime you're looking at a printout to just think about the different hairstyles that you've seen over the years or over the various webinars uh, in our own Ike Ahmed. And I'll just show a few more of these hairstyles as an example. This one here too, we can see that there's a lot of red on our deviation map. We could be very concerned that this is glaucomatous. On the other hand, when we really focus on our T-SNET plot after we've gone and made sure uh, that the segmentation is correct. And I have to say the segmentation is a little bit of an issue here, which is probably what's driving this asymmetry between the uh, superior uh, right and left bundles. You can see that these RNFL bundles are quite temporal. 
So this is a very temporal RNFL insertion. And you can see that, for instance, on the thickness map as well. I said we're more being radiologists here. And we can see that there's actually a lot of RNFL in this patient. It just doesn't happen to fall within the normative database where the RNFL usually follows. So I would not be too worried about this patient. And I would just follow this patient over time using the patient as their own control and the patient's two first scans as their baseline. I had the luxury in this patient, actually, they were followed by a retina specialist uh, in my clinic. So we can extract now the ganglion cell analysis from their regular uh, retinal scans that they do for retinal evaluation. Aside from some artifact that we see on this scan, we can see quite a bit of stability uh, over time in this patient's ganglion cell analysis, further reassuring me that this is likely an RNFL that is just atypical in nature. I think one comment just here on this on this last one and this one as well. I think you made great, great uh, comments about how to identify artifact here, which is the split bundle. The other issues are, are nasal insertion or temporal insertion. The other factor to look at as well is the optic nerve head. And, and here in this example, you can see for this degree of RNFL loss, if it really was that bad in that red zone, we would certainly expect to see some correlating rim thinning or cupping in that, in that vicinity as well. So not always, but often we do typically expect this finding. So the correlation as you've shown really nicely between, we should see consistency between the nerve head, the rim, the RNFL, and the macula, GCA, and that can really kind of confirm whether this is real or not. And obviously here you're seeing consistency. Absolutely, I completely agree. And for the most part, we can also look at our neuroretinal rim for our scans. And then we also, at the end of the day, do need to look at the nerve clinically at least by photos, but if not, getting a stereoscopic view uh, at the slit lamp. So this is just uh, the opposite example, where again, we're seeing a lot of red disease. It's not necessarily focal in nature. Again, we can be very alarmed by just glancing at the deviation map. Uh, but I think if we go down to our circular tomogram, we actually see a lot of well-segmented RNFL tissue here. In this case, it just happens to be more nasal, and that's illustrated well. And again, my favorite part of this single printout, which is our T-SNP plot, and we still see, in fact, we see some amount of RNFL that is over the normative database. This could be a patient that could be at risk for what we call green disease, where this patient may, over time, come down to the green area, and we might be reassured, thinking that there's still a lot of uh, tissue there, but they've actually had lost 10, 20, 30, even 40, 50 microns of tissue before they would go into the red disease or to the red area compared to the normative database. When we're not sure, we do have our uh, ganglion cell. And, I, have, and I, I should mention that the ganglion cell printout on the Sirius also takes into account the inner plexiform layer. So it's really a compilation of the ganglion cell layer and the inner plexiform layer, which is for most patients reasonably reproducible over time. I wanna show here a different example of a uh, red disease. And this is where two, we're gonna go through our algorithm. We're looking at the demographics. And then we go to this area here on our thickness map where there's clearly a loss. And this can be for a variety of things. So we're gonna keep that in mind. We're gonna look at our deviation map. And not only is it a significant loss, but it goes right through our circle scan. So we know right away that we're gonna have a problem. We go down to our tomogram and we can see that there's a complete loss in the acquisition in that area, which is obviously going to cause difficulties with our segmentation. So we go here to our T-SNP plot, and we can see uh, quite obvious what's happening. We know it's the right eye, and we have this loss. Now, one of the unfortunate things that happen here is when we have an acquisition loss, the RNFL goes down to zero, and we know that an area of zero can significantly impact our descriptive statistics or our summary metrics. So for instance, when we go up to this average RNFL, we know that there's an area which is zero, and we know in a setting of advanced glaucoma, the floor effect is somewhere in the 50 or 60 micron range. So this is gonna have a more profound effect than someone who had a focal significant loss. And that's where this stockbroker concept, you have to be a little bit careful. You gotta do the anatomy first. You gotta look through the anatomy first. I'll just go to a printout the next time we did this patient. This floater has actually gone right over the optic nerve. So the advantage here is that we have a segment or a circle scan, which is quite nice now. We have segmentation, which translates to a much better uh, T-SNP plot. So we've run into significant issues now in our neuroretinal rim thickness. And these floaters, as we know, can float around and they're gonna change over time. 
And that's why we gotta be very careful to just focus on these summary statistics. Of course, the average RNFL has now gone up 14 points due to the uh, uh, not having an acquisition defect. But what are your thoughts if, if someone showed you this, this uh, printout? Well, thanks, Matt. I mean, it's a very asymmetrical printout. We see uh, looking at the reliability seems pretty reasonable, but if you see, of course, a deviation map, you can obviously notice the very large area of RNFL dropout present. It certainly could be a distribution of glaucoma, but it's quite marked. There's a little bit of superior changes that are documented as well. This is severely depressed. If you look at the TISNET plot here, you can see how you know depressed this area is here how focal this area is in this very popular area there. So I, I think glaucoma has to be part of the differential here, but I'd be looking for other retinal causes or vascular causes in terms of why we're seeing this significant area of red. Great, thank you. So I, I completely agree. So I think we're, we've moved a little bit more into the realm of there's red disease that's non-pathologic and then pathologic. And I, I'm pretty convinced that this is a pathologic process, possibly is glaucoma, but quite diffuse. So now I'm going to look at my ganglion cell analysis. Again, this is possibly glaucoma. Uh, the deviation map, usually there's a little bit sharper demarcation than what we're seeing, uh, both on the thickness map and the deviation map. So that's one clue that this might be uh, something else going on. And Ike already alluded to the fact that this is quite diffuse loss uh, in Fairly. And the next clue I had is on the horizontal B scan here, where you can see that Glaucoma, and we're get, I'm going to get to this a little bit uh, in more detail in a second, is usually an inner retinal problem, not an outer retinal, but we seem to have uh, disruption uh, in the uh, outer retina there as well. So when I have that, it's very, it's very rare, Matt, of course, to have that much loss in one hemi, set, one hemi field and like almost nothing in the superior side here. Usually with glaucoma, it can be very asymmetrical in the hemi fields, but there should be something that pick, that's picked up typically in the fellow hemi field. So this is a bit another clue that maybe there's something else going on here. Yeah, completely agree. So when I have this setting, my next step is to look at the macular cube analysis, which is really what our retina docs often rely on. And I think this gives a much clearer picture of what's going on, where we see that the thickness on this map from the RPE to the ILM has been a, a completely obliterated. And this of course, this can be in the setting of glaucoma, but this is not usually caused uh, by glaucoma. And that's where I was able to look into the history of this patient, and I was already quite suspicious of a vascular event given what I saw in my imaging. And you can see here in the past, a couple findings here. One is that at the beginning, so this, we can see some evidence here of what turned out to be a vein occlusion. At the beginning, the RNFL can actually be reasonably intact, and that's because the RNFL has not been lost, and there also might be some edema in that area. So at first, the RNFL may not look that bad, and then it may look like progression later, when actually what's happening is the vascular phenomenon is, is going through its natural cycle. So we can see here in the thickness map that there was a time that there was quite a bit of thickening, and you can see some of the swelling here which is consistent with a, a vascular phenomenon. I do have patients in my practice where at the end of the day, especially when they have concomitant glaucoma, it's not clear uh, what has happened. This patient, I had the luxury of knowing beforehand uh, what had happened. And I really want to emphasize the importance of using the macular thickness uh, and really assessing the outer retina in the setting of uh, potential glaucoma damage. And this is just a very nice slide from Dr. Donald Hood in his work he showed quite clearly that the patients with glaucoma have ganglion cell loss and have RNFL loss, but their outer retina, namely their internuclear layer and their receptor and their, their photoreceptors, should largely be intact in glaucoma as a standalone uh, diagnosis. So here's another uh, single printout. Maybe I'll ask Ike again what his thoughts are uh, on this printout, particularly on the right eye. Yeah, so here we have nerves that are relatively small in nature, as you can see. I think certainly uh, they, I can't quite see, but they certainly fall below the normal range. The distribution of the RNFL loss, uh, again, can be consistent with glaucoma on the right side. You can see that there is this RNFL respecting uh, defect emanating off the nerve superiorly and inferiorly. So that would raise some questions, some concerns. The left eye looks fairly intact and there's some fair amount of asymmetry. It certainly would raise some question and some concern about whether there's some potential glaucomatous changes here. I look at the rim and the rim doesn't look that, uh, that bad on this printout as well. So that may also maybe question whether this is truly. So this is one of those ones where I think it's, again, a small disc, which is hard to evaluate. I'd be looking at the RNFL here and I'd, I'd want to look and see what the macula looks like here too. I'll put that up as well. 
Yeah, so here we have a visual field defect now that kind of helps us along a bit here. This is, this is not a typical classic visual field defect for glaucoma. Usually we often see uh, the defect emanating more toward the paracentral area. And so anything that, of course, causes any retinal damage, whether it's vascular, traumatic, infective, or inflammatory, can potentially uh, cause uh, a similar appearing RNFL defect. I'd be looking again, we want to get a good look at the fundus, look and see at the macula as well, see if we can determine what's going on here. When you look at the ganglion cell uh, complex here, you don't really see many changes, which is interesting. On the bottom, I don't know if you can point out here, on the bottom of that uh, optic nerve printout on the right side there, right there exactly. And so this is also a little bit inconsistent here. We have some inconsistency between looking at the uh, ganglion cell analysis as well as looking at the parapapillary RNFL correlating here. So there's something not matching here. Uh, for glaucoma. And so again, looking beyond glaucoma will be something that'd be important here. Okay. And I, I completely agree. And I think, especially in the COVID context, you know, this is where I don't think someone be faulted for considering glaucoma, especially if the, if the eye pressure is up and going through and treating and causing a lot more visits. Uh, I just want to emphasize some of the things that, that Ike already illustrated. One is we do see on our thickness map, some areas that do look like an RNFL uh, bundle loss. They're not exactly coming off the nerve. Uh, and as I pointed out, we don't really see a notch here. And I'd be looking clinically to see whether I can see a notch because there really should be with this amount of loss and that visual field defect, there really should be some optic nerve head changes. The other thing that's suspicious on the deviation map is we don't see a complete loss. We, we see it a little bit truncated there and it's not coming off or emanating in the same way that we know our RNFL anatomy resides in that area. And I'm just going to center in on another ganglion cell. This patient had another ganglion cell analysis performed. And like I said, even on this one, this one we're seeing a little more pathology, but it's not really looking like a regular glaucoma defect. It's kind of patchy. And then when we look at the thickness map, we actually see that there's a significant area of potential glaucoma patient, but ended up having a different pathology in the neuro-ophthalmology range. So you can look at the OCT here. So there's some red for sure, but it's not really clear what's going on. And you can see the visual fields are largely intact. But when I show you this ganglion cell analysis, we see a very congruent hemianopic uh, picture in the uh, loss, which led to further evaluation of this patient who's found to have previous demyelinating uh, lesions and has been since diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. So this patient may have had a visual defect at some point in the early stage of this demyelinating uh, lesion, but you can see the ridge residual impact on the ganglion cell analysis uh, that really helped to establish the diagnosis for this patient uh, and probably would have not been diagnosed had it not been that we'd done this ganglion cell analysis. Of course, now that I've already kind of tooted the horn of the ganglion cell analysis, it does have challenges in the artifact realm as well, uh, particularly for our patients who have coexisting retinal pathology. Uh, so our diabetic patients and our A and B patients, and this is maybe a more subtle example here where we can see we have to look at our anatomy first. We can see on our B scan that the foveal contour is abnormal, which is likely uh, due uh, to some uh, drusen or, or pigment epithelial defect here. And due to that, we get what's been called the propeller sign, which is an artifact that's reproducible in nature for this patient that's going to limit the usefulness of this test for this patient in this uh, left eye. And of course, the foveal contour can change over time, particularly patients who have uh, vitreomacular uh, traction. So it's not a perfect test, but it's something else that we can add to our armamentarium.
Thanks, Matt. So as we kind of come toward the uh, conclusion of our webinar, we want to talk a bit about progress analysis. I, after all, I think if there's one thing that's most important when we look at OCTs or visual fields, it's not so much diagnosis of glaucoma, it's whether we're diagnosing someone who's getting worse and how fast they're getting worse. And this is where progress analysis is important. And Matt has really highlighted nicely uh, the importance of looking for a potential artifact or non-glaucomatous causes of RNFL or macular loss as well as potentially just patients who are just beyond the normative database as well. When it comes to progression analysis, there is some evidence certainly that states that structural changes can occur well before functional changes. And this plays into a role in terms of where do we look at these devices in terms of COVID. If we're following somebody, if we're following somebody and we only have a limited time to see that patient with a limited exposure, are we going to be doing imaging or are we going to do functional testing or both? I think if we have good, reliable structural testing, I think we can be pretty confident. Not only can we catch changes, but we catch them earlier than we can functionally. And this is, again, something to consider as we get into this new norm of uh, post-COVID glaucoma assessment. Let's just, again, briefly talk about how do we assess for progression. And there's two primary ways to think about a printout or think about an analysis. And that's, firstly, event analysis. Event analysis is telling you whether a point or an area of points have gotten worse on a visual field or, for example, on an OCT. It's the same or whether it's gotten worse beyond a certain threshold. Uh, so it's either positive or negative. On the other hand, a trend analysis is looking more at rate. It's looking at multiple tests over time and seeing perhaps a more global function of vision or more global function of RNFL over time, looking at, at the entire area that we're looking at. And so this helps us more to look at rate. Event is more helpful to look at actually whether there's a change or not. Event is particularly useful when it comes to looking at focal areas of change. And this is just a printout again showing the OCT on the left side, the visual field on the right side. And I've just pointed out here, for example, looking at the thickness uh, deviation maps, we see focal changes in red and in yellow, as we, as we pointed out in pink over there, as you see. We see trends that we see looking at linear regression, uh, looking at the different areas of RNFL change. This gives us a time event. And this, looking at the TISNA plot here, looking at, looking at the average RNFL areas here, we can see, again, more broadly event-based changes. These are, again, three areas to look at two more on an event change and trend. If we're gonna find things occurring first in glaucoma, we're gonna look primarily on the event, here looking at the thickness map, and we're gonna look at the TISNA plot. That's primarily where we're, gonna, where we're gonna look and see whether there's been any changes. We're gonna look at more at the trend to look for the rate of change, which can tell us how serious or how fast the patient is going. This is again, very similar to visual field where we see, for example, the VFI uh, graph here showing a trend analysis. Uh, over time, the slope may be negative, a significant uh, change, or an event-based uh, changes where we see a series number of points that on confirmation show changes that are occurring in this distribution, which is classified for glaucoma. So just think about, again, how do we think about event versus trend-based changes when it comes to fields or OCTs as well? And let's just go through a few examples here. And again, just remember, of course, when we talk about looking at change, red on a progression analysis, not the same as red on a single printout. Red is basically showing we have basically two confirmatory imaging uh, dates and basically show changes from baseline. Baselines, of course, are done at the first two points in testing in a patient's uh, spectrum here looking at OCT. We talked earlier about where do we look for progression? Uh, are we going to look at the nerve? Are we going to look at the circumpapillary RNFL? Are we going to look at the ganglion cell um, layer? These are all questions, of course, that exist. And I think the answer here is going to be that we look at all of these. And here's an example where we're showing both a ganglion cell analysis on the left and we're seeing the RNFL optic nerve head analysis here as well. Let's look at the correlation here, and we can see nicely the correlation between the different printouts. Uh, what we're looking here, let's look at again first on the right side, we're looking at the thickness deviation map. We see an area that's confirmed here in the, in the quadrant here present, supertemporal quadrant, which is consistent here actually with the superior macular area here, again nicely showing the correlation here. We also see changes again in the superior thickness over time in the macula, and also consistent in the superior RNFL thickness loss here again, looking at the RNFL, both in terms of the regression analysis on average, as well as looking at the thickness profile as well. So this is a nice example where we see correlation between all the different parameters that we look at in terms of looking at the macula and looking at the RNFL as well. Let's look at another example here. And by the way, this patient here, you can see nicely confirms here that this patient also has corresponding inferior, inferior visual field progression looking at the GP analysis on the visual field. This is a nice example putting it together did we need the visual field to show this or not? Of course, there's a question, and the RNFL changes actually occurred earlier than that. This is another example where we see maybe some areas where are not necessarily consistent. 
We see here that we have, on looking at the RNFL, we have super temporal loss, which is confirmed here, present here, at least on the thickness deviation map. The average RNFL also perhaps shows some changes as well, uh, somewhat. On the other hand, if we look at the macular GCA analysis, we see the changes that are identified on the macular GCA are identified more inferiorly. Significant changes occurring here, as well as the total inferior, th inferior thickness profile. So here, we have an example where actually we see progression in different areas depending on whether we're looking at the RNFL or looking at the macula. And again, it's just another reason where I think it's important to be able to look at the entire uh, posterior pole when we look for progression. This example also showed, interestingly enough, visual flow changes that appear to be occurring in both hemifields, which again are correlate to the RNFL as well as the macula in this case as well. This is a nice study here by Dr. Liang and, and group here showing two different patients. We see in one example here, where the uh, progression changes looking at the posterior pole occur first uh, in the RNFL, as you can see here, and then later on they occur in the macula, while in another patient we see that they actually start occurring first in the macula here, as you see present here, and they occur later on in the RNFL. And so just something to think about as far as looking at progression, we have to look at the entire posterior pole. We also need to remember as well that when it comes to looking at, uh, at OCT, and Matt uh, mentioned this earlier as well, we need to consider that once we reach a certain floor, typically that's about 40 to 50 microns, either globally or in, fo in focal areas, it becomes difficult to really assess for change. It's basically a floor effect. But just because we have a floor effect in one area of the RNFL or the optic nerve or the macula, doesn't mean we can't use other areas to look for changes. In this example, the inferior pole has been significantly damaged, but the superior RNFL is still intact and useful to still evaluate to ensure that we can assess for any progression. So something to consider as well. As we get, again, continue to think about how do we utilize technology in this COVID area, the question arises, well, how frequently should we be doing testing? The answer is obviously that more we do, the better. Um, but of course, it's a certain practical limitations. I'd like to make sure we do enough testing, certainly in the early part of a patient's follow-up. This gives me an idea whether there's someone who is a fast progressor or a slow progressor. And if they're a slow progressor, I can space them out over a larger period of time. It turns out that between two to four examinations are generally reasonable to do. Uh, this allows us to detect about an average loss of about two microns per year. Remember that on average, as we age, we lose about 0.5 microns per year. So two microns per year is significant, but you do need to do from two to four uh, tests per year to do to detect this on an average. It's something that uh, we do uh, for patients that certainly we have concern for. So that's something to think about in terms of looking at patients over time and frequency of testing. Let's look at just some more progression examples here just to show, I just kind of briefly show what we're showing here. This is a nice example showing some different correlation. Here we see average RNFL thickness decreasing over time, which is consistent with the average visual field loss, as I show in blue, over time as well. And then let's, let's move over and look focally at the inferior RNFL thickness getting worse on the OCT, which correlates to the superior visual field changes, as you can see on the GPA progression analysis in green. And then finally, we see in pink here, we see superior changes occurring in all areas. We see on the thickness map, we see on the linear regression profiles, and we also see on the TISNA plot, we see progression superiorly, which actually interesting in this patient didn't show any changes on the inferior visual field. So although the, although the inferior RNFL changes were correlate to the superior visual field changes, not so much in the, in the inferior hemiquadrant on the visual field. Again, showing that structure often occur, changes occur often before the visual field, uh, an important aspect to look at when we think about testing technologies. If I could just interject on that patient, this is where too, I would I would consider doing a 10-2 on this patient. I think there is a lot of evidence that superiorly there's some changes. Could be just our visual field testing is not sensitive or it could be that it's in points uh, that are just not shown in our 24-2 just because we don't have a lot of points in the macula. Yes, I mean, that, and I think you said it well as far as being able to assess the uh, combined report to assess for central changes as well. And if we had our way, we would do 10 dashes and 24 dashes twos on, on many people, but the ability to, again, combine it is a very efficient way to, to do this. Let's look at just this last case here, just showing a patient here who has pretty early disease based on the visual field. It's a young patient. And again, I like the structure function printout that kind of shows the visual field changes overlaying uh, the uh, RNFL and the macular changes as well, as you can see on this printout. Uh, there are some spots in the visual field that you can see that perhaps may be significant. And again, as Matt pointed out, these are in the central area. Maybe we're missing uh, central spots looking at the 24-2, as Matt alluded to earlier. But certainly the RNFL is certainly damaged. Here we see the uh, progression analysis on the visual field. 
we have a lot of uh, points to look at. And if we simply look at the VFI, which I find that many people do, we'll look and see, oh, this patient looks pretty stable. They're not changing, they're fine. If we look at the actual um, you know, event-based analysis here on the GPA, we see that there are some areas possibly in the superior nasal quadrant that may be significant. Remember, one triangle really means one test has been shown to be changed. Uh, a more solid triangle indicates more consecutive testing uh, that may be occurring. But these, this sometimes can be hit or miss, but there's some subtle concern. When we go over and look at the OCT, on the other hand, I think it's very obvious and very evident that what we're seeing here is progression. We see clearly inferiorly, we see these changes occurring. And you know, even before that, I like to just even look at the, at the false color maps. Just look and just pay attention to the inferior area here. And if you just look at that inferior circumpapillary RNFL area, you can just see that actually the colors are not as red and orange as the baselines were. And certainly the inferior RNFL loss is significant and also is getting worse. So this patient is an example where looking at the RNFL really gives us a more assured view of what's happening. And the visual field doesn't really quite pick it up Visual field, of course, is something that we want to look at for function, but to look for early progression, the OCT is certainly useful. And this patient, interestingly enough, also actually had a lot of fluctuation when we looked at them on the home tonometry, and it all kind of fit in well that despite patients being the patient being relatively normal tensive, with the OCT changes, this was a concern. So we've just covered a lot of different information during this COVID era. It's a difficult era. A lot of questions that remain: How do we assess our glaucoma patients with teleophthalmology? maybe some additional diagnostics. But I think our reliance on imaging has always been moving in that direction. And I think this is pushing us even more forward to find more efficient ways to assess patients using imaging, but still understanding the report relationship between structure and function. Um, that being said, though, if we can't properly analyze a printout, and Matt highlighted really nicely to divide these patients up, whether they're truly normal, whether they're artifact, whether they're normal but beyond the normal database, whether they're non-glaucomatous or whether they're glaucomatous, that's a good way to think about these patients in terms of the printouts. And then progression analysis, again, efficiently using these with the right frequency and analyzing them properly can give us a more complete picture. Let's hope that we're going to be able to get back to work soon enough. I think these uh, ideas hopefully will permeate and we'll get more information and, and with experience, figure better ways to manage our patient more efficiently. So Matt, I want to thank you for joining us here together talking about COVID and this era and talking about how we use OCT during and after COVID. Your remarks were, were right spot on. I appreciate it. And I want to thank all the attendees here for listening in on Glaucoma OCT uh, during these COVID times. Thank you very much.